So I'm speaking to you uh, in this presentation um, as a consultant to the World Press Photo Foundation. Um, I want to begin with a couple of remarks that uh, Lars Boring, the new managing director, would make if he was here, um, just about general strategy for World Press Photo Foundation, and then I'll get on to the question uh, of ethics and manipulation and what is happening in terms of uh, the revision of the process. Um, this is an ongoing process that's going to be completed by about October, uh, and there's a series of meetings uh, taking place. Uh, we did one in uh, Paris that was hosted by Agence Vue uh, earlier in the, year, in the week. This presentation is the second one. And these are exercises to engage the professional community to get input uh, into the revision of uh, how the photo contest will run and how the question of ethics and manipulation uh, will be addressed. So we're very keen to hear your responses and your thoughts. I'll give you an email address at the end um, if people want to make uh, comments later uh, on that. With the new managing director of World Press Photo, the organization um, is stating its mission as about promoting visual journalism in the broadest sense of that term. It wants to increase understanding about new developments in visual journalism, and it wants to stimulate debate uh, within uh, the visual journalism community. And that phrase, visual journalism, is significant here because it's indicating that the foundation is open to a whole range of approaches, a whole range of formats, a whole range of channels, a whole range of different ways of doing things. And but you'll see as I go on in this presentation that the photo contest then needs to be understood as one of the things that it does amongst a much wider portfolio of activities. And when we talk about visual journalism, we're talking about photojournalism, documentary photography, multimedia, video journalism, interactives, and all the things that are yet to be invented given the pace of technological change. So the foundation is going to be open to the widest uh, uh, range of possible things uh, and uh, is you know, not going to say that one thing is better than the other. And in this sense, the idea of the World Press Photo Foundation is something that's going to be talked out a lot more, and you're going to see that it's going to have a, it has the photo contest, it has the multimedia contest, it has the photo exhibition, it has the book, it's thinking about a quarterly magazine, uh, it does research and analysis, it has education programs, it's going to promote new ways of visual storytelling, and most significantly of all, it's going to develop its web platform and social media so that it's an ongoing publisher, broadcaster, and channel for new information debates uh, and engagement with the professional community. It's going to become a much more active organization and hopes to be something of a leader in the field uh, working with the professional community. Now it's very important to keep this broad perspective in mind when I start to talk about manipulation in the photo contest because when I'm talking about manipulation in the photo contest I'm simply talking about one activity out of the whole array of activities. So World Press Photo is not going to be defined simply by its photo contest. It's be probably best known for that, but that is now going to be you know, one major activity amongst a whole range of activities. So we're, we're engaged in what's called the contest overhaul project to rethink uh, how the contest is operating based on the experience of the last two years where there has been obviously a lot of controversy around the question of manipulation. And we, what I want to outline to you here is how the World Press Photo Foundation wants to proceed with the 2016 photo contest. This is what has been worked up to this point and now we're taking it out to these meetings uh, and these groups to get feedback uh, from the community on whether these things are clear, whether you think they're appropriate, and then the foundation will take this into account and make a final decision in October and make things very clear and very visible on the website before the 2016 contest uh, is announced in November. Again, I really want to emphasize that the World Press Photo Foundation as the overarching organization is about promoting the full range of imaging technologies for visual journalism. But when it comes to the photo contest, the photo contest is about one of those imaging technologies 
photography, especially photojournalism and documentary photography. And for the photo contest, photography is understood in a particular way. It's the practice which employs a sensor or a film, a shutter and a lens to produce a picture with a single exposure resulting in a single frame. So it has a very particular understanding of photography, but this applies to the photo contest, not to the full range of activities. But we're operating from this basis, that it is about a photographer making a single exposure resulting in a single frame, and people being rewarded in the photo contest are being rewarded for their skill to make a great single exposure, or a story which is a series of great single exposures. And that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, these uh, standards for manipulation. The other thing that is kind of paramount is that we understand photography as an interpretive act. It's a creative process. This should be you know, incredibly obvious to you. But the two words that you won't hear me talk about when it comes to manipulation are truth and objectivity. It's not because accuracy is not important. We'll see that these standards about manipulation are all to do with accuracy and fairness. But once you're in the realm of photography, truth and objectivity are utterly pointless concepts. They take you down a dead end because they start to deny a lot of the very practice of photography as an interpretive and creative act in itself. We're interested in the way in which photography can produce, for photojournalism and documentary photography, the way it can produce visual documents which can function as evidence. We're interested in what photographs do not what philosophically they are. And that means we want them to function in terms of this contest as visual documents that can give an accurate and fair representation of events and issues and people. But to produce visual documents that are accurate and fair and to ensure that the audience is not misled about what they're seeing, you have to have a series of guidelines as to what counts as legitimate and what's not legitimate. And this is where standards about manipulation come in. So the purpose of standards of manipulation is to underwrite the credibility of photographs as visual documents in this sense. So the applic but there's an important kind of context for this too, because we have to take into account both the way in which photographers work and the pressures they're under and the public's justifiable need to see everything about the world even when it's particularly ugly, even when it's particularly bad. Now, when it comes to manipulation, manipulation is understood for us as being about altering the content of a picture. It's not about the processing of digital images. This is an absolutely fundamental point. Manipulation is not process about processing. Manipulation is not about the idea, as some people say, that there's too much Photoshop. That can be a judgment about aesthetics and whether you like it or don't like it, but it doesn't fall under the remit of manipulation as such. Manipulation is about altering the content of a, of a picture. And it's an important issue because we think it threatens people's trust in the, ac in the accuracy and fairness of the visual documents that photography produces. So we have standards against manipulation precisely because we un want to underwrite the credibility of images to be accurate and fair in this context. Now, obviously, the issue of manipulation is not only about what happens to the digital image file, the in-camera file, the raw file, or the, or the original negative, or whatever. But in terms of the process of making judgments in a photo contest, it's one of the most significant things you have to do. We are going to address other aspects of manipulation through a proposed code of ethics, because World Press Photo Foundation has not had a code of ethics up until now. It's referred to a couple of other organizations' code of ethics, but it hasn't had its own. Part of this project is to put together a code um, that will indicate certain behaviors and certain things that are encouraged and not encouraged. So those aspects of manipulation will be de dealt with through reference to a code of ethics. Manipulation in relationship to the digital file is done through analysis uh, in the judging process itself. We're working on the draft code of ethics. It's going to draw extensively uh, on codes of ethics that exist for organizations like Associated Press, Reuters, New York Times, NPPA in the US, European equivalents, and so on. The code of ethics is also based on trust. In the end, 
we have to trust photographers entering the contest. We can't test for everything, and nobody wants to be the policeman against everything. So the Code of Ethics is going to assume a level of trust that people entering the contest are presenting their work in a particular way, abiding by certain standards, and being open and transparent about their own process. So the code's going to set out things that photographers should think about and must do as they prepare work for submission to the photo contest. The code of ethics will apply simply to the photo contest, not to the organization as a whole, because if you're exploring more creative options in other areas, then that you don't want them constrained by these standards. These standards operate for photojournalism and documentary within the framework of the photo contest only. We'll probably publish a draft of the Code of Ethics at some stage, and people will be able to comment on that when it's available. Let's get to what happened with manipulation of images in the last two contests in 2014-15. The kind of concern with manipulation does go back to 2009 when the organization drafted a very general rule about uh, not allowing an image to be altered, but it was too vague and lacked specificity. The juries in 2014 and 2015 introduced kind of a new, well, the organization introduced a new practice for the jury where photographers had to submit raw files that were then uh, available for analysis to compare to the contest entry file. And what happened is over those two years, 33 entries were excluded for reasons that counted as manipulation. And what I'm going to do here is take you through the exact reasons and, and the types of reasons and then give you some examples because redrafting the rules and providing visual examples for what counts as manipulation is based on this experience of two years uh, of issues. So 33 entries were excluded. Two were excluded because photographers didn't provide raw files maybe for logistical reasons. There's no judgment that there was a problem with those. So we had 31 entries in two years that were deemed ineligible for the final round because of manipulation. And here are the categories that they fell into. The juries in the last two, year, two years operated on the basis that no material may be added or removed by either cloning or substantial toning. Again, it's not processing by itself. It's toning to the point that certain parts of the image went completely opaque and obscured details and backgrounds. And in effect, did the same as if you'd cloned the detail and the background out, but you just simply got to that point through substantial toning. I'll give you some visual examples in a minute to explain exactly what this means. So the juries were interested in the outcome that is, removing material or obscuring material, not, they were not making a judgment about the technical process as such. You were permitted to make changes for the cleaning of dust and scratches. These criteria were applied to all categories in the contest equally. And it's really important to understand that often, and when you see these visual examples, you might even be surprised at this, the changes that counted as manipulation are actually materially very small particularly when it comes to cloning things out. And the question you'll probably ask is, why on earth would you clone out such a small detail, really? And as a photographer, you'd want to ask that question. But even though the changes were materially small, they're regarded as ethically significant because they just cross the line that says you can't add and subtract material from the frame itself. So what were the sp specific problems that led to exclusion? There are actually, even though there were 31 entries excluded, there are actually 35 problems as such, because sometimes in photo stories, people did more than one thing. Uh, they were found in all categories, and they were all found in uh, all categories of the contest, so not just news uh, and documentary, but also nature, sports, and portraits. So. One of the largest categories of what counted as manipulation was altering content by cloning out details. 13 of the 31 exclusions were of this type. Now remember, it is acceptable to remove sensor dust or scratches on scan negatives, so that's not making up these numbers. It was not acceptable to remove physical marks on a body, not acceptable to remove small objects in a picture, reflected light spots, shadows, 
or extraneous items that remained on the border of a picture even after it had been cropped. These are the actual things that were found in the last two years in terms of altering content by cloning out details. So let's give you some visual examples. We've made these up, of course. And in fact, the subjects of the image is extremely trivial. And we've done that deliberately because the judgment about manipulation is really not about changing, at this level, is not about changing the meaning of the image as such. It's simply about crossing the line of adding and removing content. So if you look at this arm, that's the, imagine that's the original in-camera file. And then the second one is the contest file. I doubt if anyone could spot the difference between the two. I'll go back. There's the original one. There's the manipulated one. See a difference? Freckle on, some freckles on the arm, OK? That's what I mean by we're talking about materially something very small. But if you start in this, in photojournalism and documentary for this contest, if you start removing any content like that, it counts as manipulation. If this is the original file, that's the contest file. Spot what was, could you see what was removed? Go back. There's the original one. Goes out, and the answer was, there was a little cigarette butt in there that was removed. It can be a detail as small as that. It's materially small, but it's ethically significant. Because if you start allowing the removal of even those items, you can't object to the removal of much larger items that really do change the meaning of images. Here's one that would be an original. Red line goes. Shadow goes in the corner. Here's one where you start with an original that's then cropped. So a little trouble here. That's the crop, that's fine. But then a little item is taken out that remained after the crop on the end there. These replicate actual examples of images that were excluded on these grounds. So the second category that's very large is altering content by adding details. There were four exclusions for that out of the 31. This means particularly cloning in highlights, or enhancing the body or the size of a costume, or painting in object details uh, into, a, into a frame. So let's start with our arm again. Arm gets larger. Not acceptable. This is quite an interesting one to spot. If this is the original file, that's the excluded file. Go back again. Original one, excluded one. The answer is a tail is painted in on the fish there. That replicates something that actually happened. And the question would be, when you're confronted with the examples, of, is why do that? Why paint in a detail like that when the rest of the frame is perfectly fine? So the, avoiding problems for manipulation is not difficult, given actually materially these are all very small. Now we come to the, so that's adding content in, taking content out, pretty clear. Crosses a line, won't be acceptable. Here we come to the category of altering content by excessive toning. So I've stressed that manipulation is not about processing. This is the one point where it gets in processing that excessive processing becomes manipulation. And that's where you get blacks or whites in particular rendered to opaque, that is not transparent, so that you obscure details uh, and the background. Adjustments to color and conversion to grayscale are and will remain perfectly acceptable. And I'll give you some little examples of that. And there were 15 exclusions out of the total of 31 over the last two years for these issues. 
So here's an adjustment to color that's perfectly acceptable and will remain perfectly acceptable. You might start with an image like that, and it might be enhanced or processed to that. Never going to count as manipulation, not a problem. Might start with an image like this, gets enhanced, clouds are made a bit more vibrant, etc. Not a problem, doesn't count as manipulation. Might start with that, convert to grayscale. No problem, not manipulation. Those things are and remain acceptable. Nothing was excluded over the last two years for anything like that even slightly more dramatic enhancements of color and so on. So long as content was not materially altered. Now we come to when you start converting to grayscale and then you start changing blacks to opaque in areas. And I'll show you, take you through a series of six here and you'll see where the problem arises. So you might start with an image like this. No problem simply to grayscale, enhanced a little bit, no problem, that's acceptable. Here it's a little bit borderline because we're losing detail in the edges, but the jury of the last two years would probably say borderline, but okay, because it still retains detail that shows kind of the whole background. Next two, however, are where we go to the point at which it becomes excessive and constitutes manipulation. Once you lose that detail in the background, then it's a problem. And then an absolute problem is that all the background is gone. So people will have different views on whether the line is drawn correctly there. But a series of examples like this shows you that you can convert to grayscale, enhance a bit, so long as you're not actually obscuring substantial portions of the image and taking out detail and background. Same thing would happen with whites. Trivial example with the flower, you might start with this image, convert to grayscale, no problem, that's acceptable. A little bit more enhanced in grayscale, no problem, that's acceptable. Once you enhance to the point that you actually are getting solid opaque whites in huge portions of the image where there was previously detail, not acceptable. Here's something that, that happens with a few of these. People would blow out lights pretty regularly and in the process take out a lot of detail. So you'd start with an image like that, and then when it converted to grayscale, like huge swathes of detail on walls and so on would be removed. Not acceptable. Once you start obscuring things that are there as detail. We had one case of altering content on the borders by replicating material. So someone might shoot an image like this, but prefer a different crop. The crop produces gaps. And then that's filled in by cloning, by cloning the wall to the edges. Not acceptable. We had one case that's very hard to describe and took the digital, two digital forensic experts a long time to work out, because of course what they're doing is they're overlaying original in-camera files and contest files to see the differences uh, and then opening them up in Photoshop and you're seeing certain actions that have been undertaken on them. And this one took them a long time to work out. It's a little hard to explain. It involved somehow or other warping the image in a particular way to achieve a crop that couldn't be achieved by a natural crop, actually stretching the file in certain parts. So you might start with this. You might crop to that. And then you might want, the person want, might want to think about extending the sky into the left, not by cloning, but actually by stretching the image in a particular way, and in the process taking out the trees, leaving that as the final image, and because things have disappeared that were materially on the edge there, that constitutes manipulation and is unacceptable. 
So the quest, that, they're the examples that show what happened in the last two years. They actually replicate things that constituted the 31 exclusions. Now comes the question of actually drafting rules for the next contest that it keeps going with that uh, rationale but explains it much more clearly in language. Uh, and so we, at the moment, have gone from a single line which talked about not altering an image, which was not helpful, to saying that the rule will be something like the content of the picture cannot be altered by adding, rearrange, reversing, distorting, or removing people or objects from within the frame. And then there are going to be qualifications that, about limited cropping being permitted. That's quite a complex thing to word, and we're interested to hear people's views on whether or not there are limits on cropping or just cro all cropping is accepted. And then we're saying that cloning or healing tools can only be used to remove sensor dust or scratches on negatives. Then there are rule which will make clear that adjustments of color or conversion to grayscale that don't alter content are permitted. The thing that's not permitted is what's outlined there and what I've just been showing for the last few minutes. The important thing to think about in these rules, and they will be published for draft comment and we'll, we'll want people's reactions to those, is that they will be supported by visual examples like this on the website. They'll be supported by textual explanations on the website to show what's acceptable and not acceptable. So we'll take that top rule and we'll say, this means you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. This is acceptable, this is acceptable, this isn't. It, it will be not just rules there left for anyone to interpret, but the interpretation will be provided through visual examples and we think relatively clear text to explain what they are. There are still a lot of questions. I mean, when you think about all the way that technology is happening, the way that things are changing, there are a lot of factors to consider. So one of the things is cropping is going to be legitimate, but to what extent? What about lens correction, given the way that Lightroom and other software packages allow you to correct straight away? Some of the feeling now is that lens correction, because it's, it's, an, it's an artifact of the lens, it's not changing the scene, should be not an issue, but we'd be interested in hearing people's responses to that. Removing lens flare, same sort of thing. Removal of moiré, which you get sometimes on metal objects, for example. No doubt others that we haven't thought about that we want to hear whether you think there are particular things that should be issues. There's um, Anna's email address in the office. She's part of the, the project team. If you have anything that you think about later that you, know, you don't want to raise in questions now, please email Anna uh, and get in touch with her, and this will feed into the discussion, because this is something that we need some uh, input on to whether there are other issues that should count here. So that's where I want to finish. I hope that's given you an overview of what happened on this, in this area in the last two years and kind of where we're going. Uh, and hopefully clarifying and making more robust the rule and the visual examples. But we look forward to your questions and responses. Thank you. Bravo. So we open the floor for questions. Hello. You. Okay. Oh, well, let's start. Any questions? Yeah. You were talking about technical, uh, offering technical content, technical issues. What about staging images? Uh, uh, nothing said about uh, what, what, how do you react, how do you find out if the photographer stages uh, scene, sceneries uh, and then uh, pretends that this sure. was uh, logical? Yes. Yes. No, well, I said on an earlier slide, I said that we recognize that manipulation is much more than technical issues with digital files. Those questions are being dealt with by the Code of Ethics. The Code of Ethics will say that reenacting or staging events is not permissible. We have to understand that when portraits are being produced, that the way portraits are produced involves an element of posing and construction of scene, and that will be permissible. 
the rule will say that you know there is no no staging, no reenacting events, with a proviso for understanding portraits. Again, this will be supported by an explanation of what you can do and can't do in portraits. You know, we'll understand that if uh, someone goes, you know, to Liberia and produces a series of portraits against a white backdrop, you know, they've imported the backdrop, they've put the person in front of the backdrop and they've shot the image. Perfectly permissible. Won't be permissible to alter anything on their body, expand their arm, remove marks. Won't be permissible to, to alter anything after, uh, you know, from the background or the scene after shooting and producing the file. Because this is a contest that's thinking about photography as single exposure, single frame, and rewarding the skills for that. So for a portrait photographer, that skill is actually making that scene. For a news and documentary photographer, what the opposition to, to, po to uh, staging and reenacting is preventing, of course, is dressing you up as a policeman, taking you to a scene, saying this is a crime scene, and trying to pass this off uh, as you know, an accurate portrayal of a murder won't be permissible. The difficult thing, of course, is how do you test for those things when you're in the jury? And you have to be honest and say, you're not really able to. That's why there's still a huge element of trust. We have to trust the entrance. But what will, ha what will be uh, available now is, if it's disclosed at any point that there are issues with these, there will also be the organizations very keen to have a much more thorough, much more professional fact-checking and verification process when problems arise. And a report will be produced and made public for those. Uh, the reality is that's probably going to be after the event because it's not something a jury can do by itself. And no one can fact-check everybody and no one wants to fact-check everybody because the vast majority, practically everybody, are completely honest about this sort of thing. So we want to operate on that trust. But yes, crucial issue dealt with by the code of ethics, and when it arises, will be dealt with by a better fact-checking process. Yes, there's an open discussion about it. It's one of the most difficult things at the moment is actually, personally, I agree entirely with you. Now I want to find a way if, if we want to propose that to people to accept, how, how do we write that? I mean, so that we understand where the line is. Because what is so clear in this exercise is it's very hard. Language is imprecise. Language is always open to interpretation. We're never going to stop that. So we're going to have a code and rules, and then they'll still require some explanation. But even thinking about cropping, how would we write an understanding of what would be legitimate and what would not be legitimate? So yes, it's an open discussion, and the more ideas that people have as to what they think is the boundary between legitimate and not legitimate and cropping, we'd love to hear about that. Because it's, it's very hard just to say all cropping is accepted, because then you can have some very extreme versions. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think there are two things to keep in mind there. One is we're emphasizing the contest is about photography understood as single exposure, single frame. And uh, so if you are shooting in a particular way so that the original file and the contest file are pretty much the same, and the original file involves substantial blacks, no problem. You can think about this in terms of one of the winners from this year, which was the Bangladeshi project of the, of the grandparents, which is you know, predominantly white and washed out. And I saw a lot of commentary online that's like, well, that must be the most manipulated image series ever. There was hardly any difference between the raw file and the final file in that. It was shot in a particular way. So we're rewarding the skill of the photographer to shoot in a particular way. And if it's shooting with film that produces that effect, it's not going to be a problem. What, what we're talking about is shooting in a particular way, then making substantial changes that then obscure content and materially alter the content of the image. Well, one of the things that we're, we're um, trying to make clear is that going back to the darkroom analogy is not very helpful any longer in terms of digital photography. That, yes, in these debates, you know, I've heard lots of times, well, Eugene Smith did this and Eugene Smith did that, you know. I mean, I mean not only the staging part, but the, but, the, but the shooting the blacks part, you know. And, you know, current practice can't be justified by bad previous practice in that sense. I mean, yeah, you're pointing to a very important area. But I think in, if we think about it in terms of, you know, you're comparing the original file with the contest file and understanding how it's produced, uh, then, you know, those that go opaque and obscure material are relatively clear. We can make them clearer, perhaps, and we want to hear about that. But Sure. Yes. Many people didn't choose like that and not choose like that. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Dougie, you had a question. Can I get a boss? Can I get a bit more of the control? No, I think it's like one of the best things for me is like playing the New York and two. You know, so they get the thing that it's a problem to get that goes off the top of the edge of it and then kind of make sure it's playing rather than the media news. That's, that's the challenge, is to go from you know, being completely ridiculously strict to anything goes, and trying to think about how to articulate something that, it just has to be linked to that purpose of underwriting the credibility of the image. That's what we're interested in.
But that's, I mean, that's precisely, that's precisely why we're not approaching this through what I think of the, and it sounds terrible to say it, but it, you know, we're not approaching this through the question of truth and objectivity because we think photography is an interpretive act. It's creative. And it, 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 photography is inherently a representation. You're producing an image of something, a picture of something. That's not truth. That's not the world. What we're interested in is, particularly for news and documentary, is how do we underwrite the credibility of those? That's why, that's the only reason for the limits. It's a functional question, you know, uh, about that, rather than a philosophical question, actually. Um, and, you know, I think everything should be much clearer for 2016, but it will be a continual process of revision, a continual process of consideration, a continual process of debate, because things are changing so quickly, and, and we have to respond to those changes. But we'll have to be more nimble in the process. You know? um, turning color into a scale of gray is acceptable. Correct. But if you turn a red into a gray, you actually subtract some content. Take, Correct. Take a flag. You, in black and white, you can tell an Italian flag from a French flag. So in color, you do. So you, you lose some content. So. Um, but this is a, a, an acceptable, a culturally acceptable form of, of content sub subtraction. M my question is, are you aware that uh, some of your issues are culturally inflected? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think that's, that's actually the, the great cultural question of photojournalism is how black and white got to be the most authentic way of presenting the world. That's an historical question, right? That's an historical question from the 30s, 40s, and 50s about how images were produced. They became the great images of the genre, and people looked to those as having authenticity, okay? And you're, you know, in a way, logically, you would be quite correct to say conversion to grayscale is actually the greatest material alteration you can make to an image, and you should prevent it. But culture and logic don't always go together, and you know, being open to the heritage of photojournalism means you're going to keep accepting grayscale and black and white as a basic conversion. But yes, it's absolutely a, a point where there's a, if we were dealing with pure logic, it is a problem, you know, no question about that. I mean, one of the things in saying that adjustments to color are okay is, you know, obviously an adjustment to color that turned a red to a blue would not, not be okay, oddly enough even though conversion to grayscale is. So we're thinking about how to phrase that properly. But in saying adjustments to color, okay, what we're saying is it's, this is not an issue of processing. This is not about quite too much Photoshop being manipulation. Manipulation is about altering material content. And logically, that is a problem for black and white, but we're going to have to live with that logical problem. Uh, uh, I cannot word it exactly how it was worded before. But there was a line about respect and fairness to the subject. Yes. Uh, it's uh, kind of hard to um, to see what is the limit, what is the interpretation. Uh, you say that the photography is interpretative, but then I have to respect and be fair. But who is telling me if I, <laughs> I respect and fair? And what point? I mean, we had this issue that year about respect and fair. Someone put the project about the heart of the earth was not respectful mm -hmm. for their own city. It was the mayor to say that. Mm -hmm. But then people would say that it kind of looked like that, and other people didn't. What we should do a referendum at each time? It's that's complicated to me when it's respect and fair. I mean. Sure. Well, let me break apart a couple of the things there because. We're not talking about truth and objectivity, but we are talking about accuracy and fairness as kind of the standards. You're a and you're absolutely right. There's no mathematical calculation for what's respect and lacking respect. But what we're indicating there, and it will be indicated through the code of ethics, is you should think about it. And the line you said that you know we, we would take into account the context. What I'm indicating there is that it would be possible to look at the archive of prize winners in any photo competition and say that all the images of victims of war lacked respect for those victims, okay? Portraying them graphically. But then we have other questions that we have to think about. The responsibility to show everyone in the world what is happening in these situations. So 
it may be justifiable to have an extremely graphic war image in certain circumstances because of the importance of the issue. But this is not something that a jury is going to sit there and think, on a, oh, this is on a scale of 1 to 10, it's 7, that cross the line, you're out. That these, are not, these are not reasons for exclusion. These are not reasons for disqualification. These are reasons to think about what's best practice, what's the most ethical practice for photojournalism, and that's the responsibility of the photographer and the photojournalist. The jury is not going to make a judgment about that. It, by having a code of ethics, the organization is asking people who submit to the contest to think about those things and be prepared to justify them. So that if someone comes back and says, your picture of a famine victim is stereotypical, when a code of ethics says, try and avoid stereotypes wherever possible, you, may be, you can justify that on the grounds, well, this was the only way to show this event and this situation in the moment I had to shoot it. And the issue was too important not to show. And what would be the ethics of not showing it? So the point about an ethical code is they're not, it's not like traffic rules. They're invitations to think about these things, to be open about your process and be prepared to justify them. That's, that's not an issue. I mean, this is why we, we're, the last two juries, and this will, I think, will continue to be the case, you know, it's, it's about the material outcome in the image, okay? So there's not gonna be a list of these processes are fine and these processes are not. No one's gonna tell photographers how to work, okay? Photographers are gonna be rewarded for producing the best single exposure, single frame they can. And just like we accept conversion to grayscale, even though actually it's removing information, Use of light sources like that is perfectly acceptable because that's in the moment of shooting, you know. That's different from those frames where you blow out the whites in post-production and start obscuring walls and start obscuring large parts of the thing. That's in the moment of shooting. You're being rewarded for the moment of shooting. That's fine. One more, <clears throat> one more question. Hands up. <laughs> 